Trump questions Google. Some kids like their smart speakers a little bit too much. Teen influencers and a teardown of the Magic Leap and the Galaxy Note 9. All that and more coming up on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 47, recorded Thursday, August 30th, 2018. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Make this the last month your CDN bill gives you a headache. Join the thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network. For a complimentary, detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends, visit twit.cashfly.com. Welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where we talk to the makers and breakers of the tech news today, of course, big news, new iPhones, blah, 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 an event I wasn't invited to. <laughs> it's okay. Next time. <laughs> next time. There's always, it's always next, next time. time. Uh, this week, of course, also President Donald Trump claimed that Google was, quote, suppressing right-wing viewpoints. His economic advisor then announced that the administration would look into whether Google searches should be regulated. And then speaking to reporters at the White House on Wednesday, Trump said he wasn't going to look into regulating Google. Joining us to discuss this ever-evolving story about the ways in which the president could or could not go after Google is Brian Fung from The Washington Post. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So you say that although there are technically limits to presidential uh, powers in terms of uh, dealing with a situation like this, dealing with Google, there are reasons for Google to fear the wrath of the administration. Uh, let's start with uh, Trump's bully pulpit that you write about. Sure. So one of the things Trump uh, can continue to do and has been doing is uh, tweeting about Google and uh, the perceived bias that he sees um, when it comes to the way the platform treats conservatives and conservative viewpoints. Um, in fact, uh, earlier this uh, today, in fact, uh, Trump reportedly had an interview with Bloomberg in which he said um, that uh, Google faces a very antitrust problem um, in what could seemingly be seen as a uh, encouragement for uh, the country's antitrust regulators to go after Google. Um, and uh, in fact, earlier today also, um, you had Senator Orrin Hatch uh, submit a letter to the Federal Trade Commission asking regulators there to, uh, to investigate Google again. So it seems like momentum may be building for some kind of investigation or probe. It seemed to me like this was this has been inevitable, especially because in the EU, you know, it's it's been so successful over there at changing very fundamental ways as far as how Google is doing business over there. Antitrust has been a big issue over there for how however many of the last few years. And uh, so it seemed kind of like a no brainer that eventually this discussion would move over here. Are you at all surprised to hear uh, President Trump getting in so suddenly with such kind of, uh, I don't know, energy behind this idea? Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, until now, a lot of people have drawn a distinction between what's been going on in Europe and what's been happening here by saying, look, uh, Europe just has a very different system. Um, in the United States, typically, we rely on courts and the court system um, to police companies after the fact, you know, after violations have occurred. Um, and because of that, you know, it's not really likely that we would see something uh, drastic happen uh, to, to Google or other tech platforms. Um, but increasingly, you know, with the president weighing in on these matters, uh, it looks like we may see something happen to these companies sooner rather than later. Um, and that pressure might only build next week when uh, the Senate Intel Committee meets to uh, talk to some of these tech companies. And Google um, has yet to respond as to whether or not um, it will send uh, someone, uh, a senior decision maker, to uh, to testify. So that, that you know, we're, we still need to see what happens there. So the big con congressional hearings of the year so far have been Facebook's congressional hearings, and arguably there was there was real meat to what needed to be discussed about the way that they were treating our personal information um, and what they knew about and what they didn't. But but what Trump is saying about Google and sort of possibly pushing for congressional hearings, as you say in your piece. Uh, hasn't 
but he doesn't really have a lot of evidence for that. I mean, he posted on, he tweeted a video saying, uh, claiming that uh, Google uh, didn't show his State of the Union address like it did for Obama's State of the Union address. Talk a little bit about, about that evidence. Sure. So uh, yesterday, the president tweeted this video that purported to show how Google didn't promote um, Trump's State of the Union addresses when, uh, in, when you know, earlier in earlier years, uh, Google had put links to live coverage of uh, President Obama's speeches to the country. Um, you know, later turned out that that was kind of inaccurate. Uh, if you go look at the Internet Wayback Machine, archive.org, um, it actually, uh, you know, you do see screenshots of, um, you know, the the Google homepage where there is a link to live coverage of President Trump's State of the Union address from this year. Um, Google also later said uh, after this video came out that um, it typically does not um, do that type of promotion for the first uh, speech that presidents give to a joint session of Congress, which is not considered a State of the Union address typically. So, um, you know, it seems like even as the president is criticizing the tech platforms for uh, you know a skewed viewpoint, the evidence that he's marshalling for uh, for his his argument um, is itself somewhat flawed. Yeah, I think what's uh, what's interesting, what what I'm waiting for, embracing for, is some sort of attack against the Wayback Machine, saying you know <laughs> that it's been gamed, and I would not be surprised at all if we at some point hear that. Um, but aside from that, like another part of this video that really kind of seemed to st stand out to people is the general timeline, and this is kind of on a nerdier sense of understanding like what Google has done over the last couple of years. A 2016 screenshot showed an old school version of the Google logo. Yet in 2015, Google rolled out a brand new logo branding that was like this more ser serif style font. And, you know, if you, of course, if you go to the Wayback Machine, you actually see that, which kind of points to another, another level instead of just merely pulling screenshots from a source and saying, hey, look, here's the source or here's, here's the proof. That almost kind of hints at some sort of image manipulation. Like, have we heard anything about that? You know, I haven't heard uh, as much about that, so that that's rather unfamiliar to me. But I, I think you kind of hit on an interesting point, which is um, just how much Google has changed and how frequently it has changed um, over the years. And uh, you know, it's gotten to this point where um, it's almost a, a victim of its own success, where people now uh, have heard so much about the ways that Google um, uses data and personal information that they just sort of assume um, that uh, search results are incredibly personalized. And when you talk to researchers who've looked into this and run side-by-side -side tests, um, they actually tell you, look, the level of personalization that you find in Google search results isn't all that much. Um, you know, one researcher I spoke to from Northeastern University earlier this week said, you know, he had groups of people browse Fox News uh, before running a Google search. And he had other groups of people uh, looking at CNN before running a Google search. And uh, in fact, the ultimate outcome showed that there wasn't very much difference between the two. Hmm. So like Twitter or Facebook, I mean, Google is so huge that it's hard to just say, well, it's the algorithm. You know, we can't, you know, they do make decisions, as you point out in your own Hatch piece today, um, they made decisions about um, advertising for pay, uh, payday loans mm -hmm. and selling uh, firearms. And so there are uh, editorial decisions that Google has to make. I mean, what do you make of that, though? The fact that they, I mean, that, that they are such a big platform, is it right for them to be making these decisions? Yeah, well, I would say two things on that. One is, um, you know, it's not just those decisions, uh, you know, based on whether or not Google decides it wants to do business with some of these entities, but also, you know, there have been reports about Google trying to set up an entirely separate version of its search engine in China that would comply with Beijing's uh, censorship regime. Um, so clearly, you know, Google has the capability to change what users see. Um, and it's a big question as to whether or not uh, Google would um, engage in that type of behavior in a society like uh, the United States. And then secondly, you know, we're talking about algorithms that are, um, you know, getting increasingly sophisticated. And, um, you know, the latest research in machine learning and AI suggests that, you know, when engineers develop these sorts of tools, um, 
it's very hard to understand what exactly is going on in these sort of black boxes. Uh, and the only way that researchers can sort of figure out what the logic of any given decision is, is by trying to reverse engineer it based on the results. And so, you know, we're seeing some of that play out in Google News, um, which is uh, technically a separate product from Google Search. Um, and, you know, I think we're just going to see see more of that um, in the years to come as, as AI and machine learning become much more prevalent. Well, do you think he could uh, issue an executive order about this, about Google? I think um, the executive order route is a little bit complicated. Um, you know, it's not clear who, which agency the, um, the president would be asking to act on uh, on this, uh, typically, you know, an executive order is directed at uh, an executive agency, an executive branch agency, um, not an independent agency like the just, you know, the Justice Department's antitrust division or um, the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and so, I think it would be very difficult for the president to tailor um, an executive order on Google uh, or addressing Google uh, that stays, you know, on the right side of the law. And also, you know, that would raise some pretty serious First Amendment questions, too, as to whether or not, um, you know, the, the White House can legally go after Google in that in that way and restrict, um, you know, Google's ability to, uh, uh, you know, to um, present search results as it as it wants to. Um, in fact, I believe some courts have already ruled that, in fact, uh, search results are sort of a form of curation um, that deserve First Amendment protections. Hmm. Well, there's lots more to read about this at the Washington Post technology section. Thank you so much for joining us. Brian Fung is a tech reporter for the Washington Post and is B underscore Fung on Twitter. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Brian. My pleasure. Appreciate it. The so last week, we spoke to Georgia Dow, psychotherapist and writer at iMore, about helping kids manage tech as they head back to school. As it turns out, we did not exhaust this topic. This <laughs> week, we're joined by Teodora Pavkovic, psychologist, speaker, and expert on parenting in the digital age. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So let's start with smart assistants, uh, Amazon Echoes, Google Homes, Cortana's HomePods. Uh, they're all blanketing a lot of our homes. What kind of effects are, yeah. are these devices having on kids, especially young kids? Yeah. Um, so it's actually estimated that within four years, um, about 55% of households are going to have one. Um, and I was just talking to a, a friend of mine a couple of days ago, and she was very excited, excitedly telling me um, about how cute it is to see her, her little son interact with, with Alexa. So it is cute on the one hand, um, but there are some things that I think we need to take into consideration as well. Um, and I think the, the, the two pieces of, of recent psychological research that we really need to think about when we're thinking about this kind of um, technology are for one that um, scientists at Emory University in um, Atlanta, Georgia, found that children as young as two years old are very conscious of being watched, being observed, and they will try and change their behavior in order to get a positive response from the adults that are around. So that's one thing. Um, then the, the other one is a recent study at University of Plymouth um, that found that kids between the ages of seven to nine, um, they'll conform to the influence of robots around them. And again, that will allow them to influence their behavior. And then I think the, the final psychological uh, fact, really, that we need to take into consideration is one that, you know, anybody who has seen Castaway and remembers Tom Hanks's little friend Wilson um, will know what I'm about to say. And that's the fact that we're very social creatures. Um, we need to have at least one human right there available to us. And if we don't have them, we'll make one up. And so, um, you know, the I think the implications there are really, really widespread. There are a lot of different things that we need to um, to think about. We need to think about, um, you know, what do what do kids think when they see mommy and daddy interacting with these inanimate objects with a voice coming out of it, um, saying, you know, thank you and uh, you're welcome. Maybe sometimes uh, getting a little bit frustrated with them, basically interacting with them as though they're human and yet they're not. Little children can't really tell the difference between these things. So um, at the very basic level, we have some safety concerns, privacy concerns, things like, are we being recorded? Are we, you know, are we being listened to? Advertising to children um, is another big one, especially with, um, you know, brands such as Nickelodeon and Lego kind of jumping on the, the bandwagon, trying to um, expand into, into this um, home speaker space as well. 
in order to sell their their products. Um, there are these psycho-emotional developmental things that we uh, do need to think about. And a lot of times parents are just not aware of these simply because, um, you know, these companies are not going to put a big yellow warning label on the box saying, you know, make sure you think about this before you let your kid talk to Alexa or, or whichever one it is. So some of the issues are things like um, children being confused about the difference, um, you know, between the device and a person, the difference between these two things, um, children forming an attachment to these devices, um, completely losing the ability to be bored. That's a very big one. Mm -hmm. And yeah. develop their, uh, their imagination. Um, and, uh, um, you know, children becoming very impatient. That's something that, that parents have have been noticing already. On, you know, on the one hand, we tend to criticize the millennial generation for being very, um, you know, the instant gratification generation. And yet with kids observing the way we interact with some of these home speakers, we're kind of teaching them uh, to be exactly the same way. Yeah, it's been really interesting. Uh, five and an eight-year-old daughter in the house, and we've got Google Homes right. in all of the rooms and really interesting seeing them and w making the realization that their lives will you know, began more or less with the memory that it's normal to kind of talk to technology and to, in some ways, build yep. some sort of a relationship with a yep. non-human, you know, technological mm -hmm. sort of entity. Like how, Absolutely, how, yeah. how, how do, does their interaction with these smart assistants, because I know my kids talk to them all the time. Usually it's to play music, but they talk to it all the time. They understand kind of the cadence and, and how you do that. How do those interactions then interplay with inter their interactions with actual humans? Sure. So that's a really interesting question. Of course, it's the most um, pressing one right now. Unfortunately, and I think this is something that the statement is is one we're hearing a lot. We don't have enough research to right. really know, right? Not enough time um, has passed. I think at this point, um, it's something like maybe 20% of, of households are estimated to have um, these these smart speakers. So, That's and you lot. know, with kids of, of various ages. So it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of home. It's certainly a lot of children exposed to this technology, but not enough. They haven't been exposed to it for long enough where we can say, okay, these are the patterns that we're seeing. Um, some of the things, again, from from psychological research that we know is that in order to, for example, learn language, children really need to hear it spoken from another human being, a live human being. And there there has been some research where um, small children were exposed to recordings of a few sentences and then had a human say those same sentences and they wanted to see, you know, from whom the child would pick up uh, more vocabulary and they did pick up more from the human. So we're built to learn from other humans. Um, our brain's built to develop through the interactions with other humans. Um, that's just, you know, simply a fact. So um, with that as a, as a starting point, when we ask that question, how is this technology going to impact kids, um, it, it, it's hard to say. We need a, a lot of time to pass before we know that. But, you know, from me, from my perspective of being a, a coach and having the psychological background, it, it doesn't look too great. Um, uh, one of, well, a few articles that I've written recently that have talked about, you know, should these um, smart speakers be used to teach children um, how to be polite to other people. One of the main issues there is that based on the research that I mentioned earlier, kids can't really tell the difference between a machine and a person f for, you know, a, a certain period of time. It's very confusing for them. They can't quite tell the difference. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if the right way to go is to teach kids that a device is kind of the same as, as a human being. It should be shown, you know, respect and, and politeness and appreciation and all these these different things in the same way that another human being can. I think, um, I think the one effect that I can say for sure it will have on kids is it's bound to confuse them. Hmm. That's for sure. Well, Jason, if you uh, go into your kids' rooms and see that they've painted, like, um, with their blood, those Wilson eyes on their oh Google Home, Don't like the say soccer that, ball, <laughs> then they know call you. Me. You, call yeah, me. Call me. Yes, you I'll keep your contact information and I'll get in touch. So <laughs> you, you've also written pieces about screen-free weeks. Now, this is something um, yeah. at the beginning of the summer, we had uh, a big goal to do this as a family. We did not. And I think uh, out of my three teenagers and my husband and I, I am the most terrified of having a screen-free week. What <laughs> tips do you have to actually do this with your family? 
Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so there, there's the, uh, the little poster that um, people can find if they just go to my, to my website. You'll be able to see it in my uh, resources and, and recommended uh, book section. So, it, you know, this is, this is not a, a hard science. And I'm sure, you know, if you do a search online, you'll find lots of really great um, organizations and websites that give all kinds of really, really useful tips and tools for, for how to do this with your family. Um, with with this um, this little kind of uh, poster or this this guideline, I pointed out eight things in particular um, that are screenless. And my main tip for this is not to so much think of it as you know what you're not going to be doing. So going screen free, because that's a very negative way of, of looking at it, but look at it from the perspective of this is what I am going to be doing during these, um, the, the next week or, or more. This is what I'll be doing with my kids. This is what they're going to be learning about. And they're going to learn all these you know amazing things while we do it. Because the brain has this little obstacle where if you tell it to not do something, not think of something, not eat something. That's exactly what it wants. And so I think that's one little kind of tip to start off with. But um, I'll just go through these um, very briefly now. And again, people can can download this uh, for free and print it out, put it on their fridge if they want, just so they have it as a reminder. But um, the first thing is to, to, to enable your kids to help other people in person. Um, this will really uh, help them build a sense of purpose, um, a sense of meaning. Um, you know, one thing that I noticed um, that really stood out for me uh, when I was uh, listening to some of the um, the interviews that that have been shown on TV um, with the recently deceased Senator uh, McCain is that he talked a lot about being part of something that was greater than himself. You know, whether it was his his role in the government, his his role in the in the military. So, and that is a, a kind of a psychologically proven fact that when we're part of something that's greater than ourselves, we find a lot of meaning and a lot of purpose. Um, and that comes from the field of existential psychology. So, really help your kids get involved with other people and help other people. Um, move around, um, you know, uh, children develop physically by basically fighting against gravity, right? From the moment they, they try and kind of lift themselves up when they're tiny. This is what we're doing our whole lives. That's how we build our, our muscle strength. So really get them to move around as much as they can. Um, if you need to make it fun by getting them to, you know, wear their, their fun dress up clothes or put silly, you know, paint on their faces, get their friends involved, siblings, whatever it is, but make it really, really fun um, to make it easier for them to do. Um, the third thing is connect. Um, so, you know, speak to each other, uh, look at each other, um, be physically affectionate with each other, use a lot of touch. All these um, activities secrete what we call the love hormone oxytocin and it helps children feel love it helps them feel um, safety helps them feel acceptance as well and then the fourth one is notice and that's a really big one you know if you're um, if you're you know a lot about mindfulness practices that will will be very familiar to you. So help them to literally and, and symbolically stop and smell the flowers, um, to become aware of their surroundings, to become aware of their thoughts, of their feelings, to really notice little details about how things taste. Um, and it will help you learn this skill, you know, while helping them do it as well. The fifth one, probably my favorite one is help them discover their strengths. Um, there's a big movement that's been going on for a few years now um, called, you know, strength-based uh, parenting. And there's strength-based um, therapeutic approaches as well, which I love. So basically catch your children doing well. When they do things well, really compliment them a lot on these things and point out exactly how they accomplished whatever it was that they accomplished. Just be careful to not compliment their um, character, their personality, but really compliment the behavior that you're seeing, whether it's being effort, effortful, um, you know, having a lot of purpose in what they're doing, perseverance, um, courage, whatever it is, um, and help them figure out some of their top strengths and then help them use those strengths on a daily basis. Um, and if your child is older than 10, you can actually go over to the VIA character strengths survey website. Uh, where you can help them fill out the survey. You can do the adult version yourself and you'll get a really nice list of 24 strengths. Um, the top five are kind of your your top strongest character strengths that you can both actually practice using more of on a daily basis. And then 
The sixth one is reading and reading a lot. And I mean, we, you know, the research on this is absolutely definitive that this is how children learn language best when you read to them as much as possible. Um, You know, once they get older, if you can't read with them, discuss with them what they're reading and really use that opportunity to get to know your kid, get to know what kind of person are they? Would they like, would they not not like? Um, What are their opinions on things? How do they see the world? Um, And really use this to also teach them things about the world as well. Um, And then the seventh one is learn. So help your kids learn in a tech-free kind of way. So, you know, take them to museums or lectures or, you know, the zoo, a farm, um, you know, a new restaurant, um, um, a new part of the city, maybe that they've never been to before and sign up for a tour of that area. So any way that you you can help them to learn um, that is not dependent on a device of some kind. And then the final one that I mentioned a little bit earlier is um, let your kids be bored. A lot of parents struggle with, um, you know, whether it's to, you know, screen-free, tech-free weeks or summertime. Um, I don't know if I have any friends who didn't send their kids off to a camp of, <laughs> of some kind. Um, even on topics, you know, g- camps that have nothing to do with anything that the child really enjoys, they just okay, I need to put them somewhere. Um, and a lot of it comes from this fear of letting your, your kids be bored. Um, and boredom is incredibly important important. Again, we don't have enough time to go into all the, the various you know research that's been done on this, but it's really good for the brain. It's really good for the developing brain, um, which our brain is right up until we're about 25. It's not done forming fully until that point. So let them be bored um, because that will teach them to, um, you know, to, to process things, to process their experiences, to consolidate memories, um, to use their imagination, to be creative. Um, it will also teach them to be self-reliant, which again, um, we're not we're not helping kids um, learn that, not, not enough anyway, but also all sorts of uh, wonderful things like that. Teodora, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Teodora Pavkovic is a coach, a psychologist. Where the, where's the best place to find out more about uh, what you do and um, all your the, your resources? Yeah, so a number of different places. I'm uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on um, Twitter as well. I think if you just on Twitter, if you put in my, my first and last name, you'll be able to find me. And then the website um, is right there. So it's T-O-P Coaching. Um, which is another good place to to find me. Twitter is probably the best where I kind of, I I post the most things there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Theodore. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. After the break, do you know how much your kids are earning on as Instagram influencer? Taylor Mm -hmm. Lorenz from The Atlantic does. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Remember the last time you were woken up at 3 a.m. with frantic phone calls because your CDN experienced another outage? Unreliable tech support is the scourge of every business because you know that every second your site is down is money being lost and on your watch. That and unpredictable usage-based bills. You don't want that. Make the switch. Cashfly has been building trusted CDN relationships since 2002. Cashfly eliminates CDN outages, helps customers reach new markets, and controls costs for all of their customers. They guarantee 100% availability with their bulletproof 100% SLA, supported by an expert team of smart, easy to talk to, and agile techs that can answer all of your questions the first time without having to pass you around to five different departments. Now, if you're in software or podcasting like I am, or any other business that relies on having your content readily available to your consumers, it's hard to predict bandwidth consumption for the month. Even worse, it's frustrating when companies try to lock you into a contract that is not flexible and is not built around your unique demand and traffic patterns. Make this the last month your CDN bill gives you a headache. Say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week or worse, even daily trying to track your CDN usage. On average, customers who switch to Cashfly save more than 20%. Just imagine what you could do with that 20% in your time when you don't have to micromanage your usage or worry about having to commit to a long contract based on a growth plan that you didn't even write. That is a crazy way to buy CDN. As Leo has been saying, we've been hosting all our podcasts, audio and video on Cashfly for nearly a decade. Every month, our viewers and listeners download petabytes of data fast and flawlessly. Twit just simply would not exist without Cashfly. Join the thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network and let Cashfly give you some sanity back. Now, I have an exclusive offer just for you, our Twit listeners and viewers, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. See if you might be leaving 20% or more on the table. If 
Find out more at twit.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. That's C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y. And we thank Cashfly for their support. All right. So the summer is winding down to a close, as unbelievable as that may be at this point. And teens across the country are trading in their summer jobs for fall classrooms, or so I thought. Some of them are. Others will probably continue working their summer jobs indefinitely, <laughs> possibly even from the classroom. I don't know when they return as they continue monetizing their Instagram accounts. Joining us to talk about this new kind of summer job is Taylor Lorenz from The Atlantic. Welcome, Taylor. Hi, guys. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. So yeah. uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about how these teens are, are kind of becoming the facilitators of sponsored content on Instagram. I didn't even realize this was happening. Yeah. So basically, um, sorry, I'm a little low here. Let me fix this. Um, <laughs> oh, is That's this good. okay? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Um, so basically, I mean, more and more brands are looking um, to work with sort of um, regular, I guess, quote unquote, regular teams instead of um, traditional influencers. Um, they feel like it's just more organic. Um, the teams do a good job of promoting it. It seems more natural to have like a post from your friend, um, you know, promoting something as opposed to something from some aspirational influencer. So they're working. They're sort of like reaching out more directly to these teams on Instagram and offering them um, sponsored deals. Of all the things that I thought I would have to teach my teenagers, I didn't think it was don't use your friends to sell stuff. But apparently that <laughs> is something that, I mean, because does that come, I know you talk to a, a, a lot of teenagers. Um, does that come naturally to them? Do they understand like, wow, like all these people are following me because they want to see me, um, you know, just have fun throughout my day. And then I'm using them to sell a product. I don't think they think of it that way. Um, I don't think that they think of it as using anyone. I think they just sort of like, I think teens increasingly kind of recognize their own um, sort of cultural capital that they have from being a teen. Um, you know, brands want to work with them. So it's not really seen as like selling out or spammy in the same way. Um, so, I mean, like most kids I talk to, like if their friend did a brand deal, they were like, oh, that's awesome. Like get money. Like sure, I would do the same thing. Like I, you know, also asking their friend to put them in touch. So I think it's kind of like, they don't really care. A lot of them have multiple Instagram accounts too. So it's not like, you know, this huge thing where they're suddenly like spamming all their best friends. So uh, talking about, you know, friends uh, on Instagram, how many are we, are we talking about here? Because I mean, in the, in the old guard, I would say, it was there was a lot of emphasis on you've got to have amassed this huge follower count, but I I mean I'm just guessing a lot of these you know the the kids that are agreeing to do this probably don't have hundreds of thousands of followers right they have a select no, few is it more about close. quality versus con versus uh, quantity? Yeah, I mean they might have like 800 to a thousand followers, which is like way not that much. Um, maybe they'll have. 2,000, 3,000. Um, these brands are pretty much eager to work with any teens that have an organic audience of other teens. So, um, you know, they don't, and they're only paying like $5, $10. So they don't, you know, it's not a huge, um, they don't really need somebody with that much scale. They don't really want someone that seems almost more inauthentic to have mm -hmm. that kind of scale. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of teens that are just sort of have a few thousand followers. I mean, some kids, of course, have more like 20,000 or some kids have like a meme account that they've grown bigger um, that they're monetizing. But for the most part, um, they're kind of like the kids are like 10,000 followers or under, which is not very much for a teen. Mm -hmm. So so they don't feel like they're selling out. So is, is there is there a downside to this? I mean, I know you write about how some teens are taking advantage of. There aren't a lot of contracts. Can you talk a little bit about how the shadiness that might be going on among uh, these advertisers and teenagers? Yeah, so there's obviously a lot of room for, you know, shady behavior and for these companies to take advantage of the kids. Um, you know, there was this huge blow up with this um, account called So Aesthetic Shop. So Aesthetic Shop, uh, which was this um, online retailer that was refusing to pay all of these teens. And over 20 girls had actually done work um, for So Aesthetic and uh, not received payment. Um, and the, also the people were sort of bullying them, like the owner of the account was, would just block them when they asked for their money. And, you know, they were doing a lot of hours of unpaid labor. Um, and so that kind of, um, you know, predatory behavior is, is more common in these types of situations, just because like these girls are like 13 or 14 years old. They're not negotiating contracts. There's no adult supervision. Um, so, you know, sometimes they can get taken advantage of. They kind of accept that. Like they, the girls I talked to were like, yeah, even if like 
10% of the, you know, deals I do, I'd end up not getting paid for. Like I'm still getting money in my pocket. So yeah, getting, um, getting money using social media. Like I imagine, you know, especially as a teen, like that's, that's kind of a dream right there because I mean, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people that they are following who are doing the same thing, you know, like, uh, you know, stars, you know, uh, celebrities, they're using these platforms to do just that. So it's almost a yeah. way for them to kind of connect on that level and be like, yeah, I'm doing that too, making some money. Of course, I'm going to be, you know, be happy to do that. A lot of the places where these brands find these girls is in the comment section of popular YouTubers. So, uh, you know, like these teenagers will comment on popular YouTubers, Instagrams, like, oh my God, you look so pretty. I love your hair, whatever. And a brand will like slide into their DMs like, hey, are you a teen? Like, you know, we want to work with you. <laughs> that sounds so um, ominous. <laughs> Hello, teen. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. I know. I was like, do you guys get creeped out? And they're like, not really. I don't care. Some of them made email addresses, but they're kind of like, they're getting the money over PayPal too. So um, yeah, they kind of don't really care. Yeah. Hey. All right. Do, they, do you think their parents know that they're making this money? Yeah, good question. I would say 50-50. I talked to a lot of girls where their parents don't know. Um, they have, you know, in some cases, hundreds of dollars in PayPal that they sort of use to shop online. And, you know, they buy the kind of stuff that their parents probably wouldn't buy for them. Mm -hmm. um, and other girls, you know, did tell their parents. I interviewed a few parents who did know for the story and they were all really proud of their kids. Like, you know, the one mom who I think I quoted was very nervous at first. She was like, what do you mean this brand is messaging my 13 year old daughter? But once she sort of saw, um, you know, what her daughter was learning, um, she was proud. Like a lot of the parents I spoke to were like, look, you know, is this kind of shady of the business to be paying my daughter $10? Yeah. But at the same time, it's teaching her business skills. It's teaching her marketing sales requests. It teaches them responsibility. Like these girls will have to deliver on their sponsor content by a certain date and, you know, get stuff together. So it, it sort of teaches them, I don't know, it teaches them really good skills. Um, it's just obviously you know, none of them are going full. They're still balancing that with schoolwork and other things. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very entrepreneurial, you know, it's like a window into an entrepreneurial world. Uh, and yeah. who knows what that blossoms into as they get older. That could be yeah. a big deal. I mean, a lot of these kids, some of them are just like insane Instagram marketers. So, um, they'll just like, they have a very deep understanding of like social media marketing. Um, some of the kids, some of the stores, some of the retailers that pay these kids are actually run by teens themselves. So, a couple of kids that sort of got into sponsored content over the past few years were like, hey, why am I only getting paid $10 from these stores? I could just set up my own online store, market it with my other team friends and make a lot of money. Some kids have made tens of thousands of dollars that That's way. So, so. smart. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> yeah. Smart. Well, yeah. okay, we're shifting gears entirely. Like these two stories are completely <laughs> different. But um, yes. you, you posted, uh, Taylor, you, you wrote earlier this week about how teens are increasingly more aware, more clued in on current events, particularly political events. And uh, personally, like, it's awesome to see teens so engaged with politics. Yet what you're writing about, you, you tell us about how teens view politics and news media as they grow up socializing in social media. And there's not a whole lot of, like, there's not a whole lot of positive as far as how they view the news in light of where we are right now in, in yeah. the world of social media. Tell us a little bit about that. So, yeah, it, um, I, I sort of um, wrote a story basically about um, the ways that teens view media. It is, it is negative in a lot of ways. Like, I mean, the, I think teens have huge, huge, huge skepticism, especially towards um, traditional news outlets. So, you know, there's all these like cries from the president and older people of fake news. Um, and that's really carried over for a lot of teens, too. I mean, keep in mind, like skepticism and sort of anger and um, negative associations with the mainstream media. Media, like those levels are, are already very high um, mm -hmm. in within adults. Um, so it is unsurprising that it would trickle down to teens because teens are ultimately living in those households. And if they hear their parents saying stuff like that, they're going to naturally kind of be susceptible to it. But it's also the fact that, um, you know, they're growing up on the Internet and they kind of don't believe anything they see. They kind of have like an innate skepticism towards things, um, which you would think would be good. But they have that skepticism carries so far into um the fact that they question like actual reported news. Um, you know, I think also they've seen how biased and sort of like headline, you know, like attention grabby certain headlines can be. They kind of are familiar with the whole viral content um, cycle. And so, yeah, they just don't really um, trust hard news sources very much um, the way that previous generations of kids did. 
Well, did they? Because, I mean, I'm thinking of, like, trust no one, trust no one over 35. Like, I mean, isn't this, <laughs> yeah. like, a thing that, um, yeah. you know, everyone's generation experiences? How is it different? Mm -hmm. Not to this extent. I mean, I think what's different now is that the media is sort of more saturated than ever. So while, you know, kids are like, look, kids are always skeptical. Kids are always also like not believing what their parents say and kind of always like, mm -hmm. you know, there's like a huge counterculture. But I think um, the media environment right now has changed so much. So the fact that there are so many hyperpartisan sites um, and independent news journalists that are usually very partisan. So I think like kids pick up on that and with social media and just like the fact that like there is rampant um, misinformation I think that they're just way more skeptical. They also are more likely to seek out um, news from like individual people rather than like institutions. So they're more likely to trust like a YouTuber or a podcaster that they know really well and sort of know their biases as opposed to like New York Times where they feel like, you know, they're biased. They're just not admitting it. Yeah, fascinating. And you also talk a little bit about political Instagram, which is another. Yeah. Apparently, I know nothing about Instagram, which you know I fully admit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, the 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 politics Instagram is really crazy and interesting. Um, I want to do another story on like teen politics influencers because it's this whole world. Um, sure. But it it you know I think like a lot of kids they go onto social media by default to kind of um, find out more information about what they're reading. So Instagram is obviously a natural outlet for that. And Twitter, of course, too. Yeah. Taylor Lorenz uh, with The Atlantic. I'm a huge fan of your work. I really appreciate you taking time. Thanks, guys. Uh, Sorry about the today. janky feed. No, it's all good. I appreciate you having me. <laughs> it all worked out, Taylor. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. We'll reach out again. You write great talk stuff, you so soon. we'll follow you. Take care. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. <laughs> So Magic Leap it has kind of been a little bit of an obsession of mine uh, over because the last couple of years it's been so you know shaded in secrecy. Uh, finally, it's available to the public. The company hopes that you're going to jump at the chance to drop a paltry $2,299 for a pair of its high-quality, high-profile mixed reality goggle technology. And it's been a long time coming. Honestly, I'm of the opinion that after this much buildup, I don't know how you feel about this, Megan, but it's going to be next to impossible for them to live up to that, right? They've set, them, set the bar so high. Regardless, I'm excited to check it out for myself, and I hope that I get the chance to soon, like the team at iFixit did. They got their hands on one, and as they usually do, they wasted no time spilling its high-tech guts all over the place and documenting the experience along the way. Joining us to talk about the Magic Leap Teardown is Jeff Suvenon from iFixit. How you doing, Jeff? Hi, good. How are you guys? Doing awesome. It's great to get here. Thank you uh, for taking time to talk to us about this, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about the Magic Leap and then maybe also about the Note 9, but let's start with the Magic Leap because I think that's the more interesting piece of hardware that we haven't seen before. Before we get into the, the teardown, you got to spend a, a little bit of time with it, actually wearing it and experiencing what it has to offer. What do you think? Very little, yeah. Uh, you know, so we don't do product reviews; we do teardowns. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, the play time was very limited. I only got a few minutes with it, but um, it was very interesting. Um, I, you've probably had some experience with VR headsets, like yeah. I have. I've, I've tried the Rift and the Vive and things like that. I got kind of a similar. Uh, wow factor from this. It felt like having interactive holograms in the room with you. Um, so that was pretty neat. Um, so, so it was convincing enough. But, I, I, but was it revolutionary as I, I think they would they would want it to be? I think it depends. It was my first AR experience. I thought it was pretty cool. But oh, I'm okay. hearing from folks who've tried like Microsoft's HoloLens that it's uh, a pretty pretty comparable. Better, but oh, okay. but not necessarily a quantum leap forward. Got it. All right. So I, like you said, you know, you, you played with it a little bit, but you really tore this down. And that's kind of what this is all about here. Uh, everything that we saw in advance and that, that we're seeing is that this is a high quality, you know, builds and, you know, the components are unlike anything you've seen before. Upon closer inspection, what did you think? Yeah, I think that's mostly true. Um, I think it's really clear to us that they really spent a lot of time on the ergonomics, on getting the weight down. It's arguably, you know, the best looking um, head mounted display, <laughs> which is saying uh, a lot because it's still today. pretty goofy looking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I still felt pretty dorky wearing it, but, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's definitely an improvement. It's, it's getting much better. Um, and I, I think they spent a lot of money most likely on stuff like manufacturing custom waveguides. That kind of thing doesn't come cheap. Um, on the not so premium end, um, the controller tracking is a little bit last gen. Uh, we were a little surprised by that. Um, and then, of course, the optics itself, you know, the displays are very cool. Um, but as you kind of alluded to earlier, they fall short of sort of the hype that 
that Magic Leap has been building up over the years. Mm -hmm. um, so that was interesting. I know uh, Palmer Lucky reviewed the Magic Leap. He also helped a little bit in the teardown. He did. Uh, you know, we've had um, several friendly exchanges with Palmer over the years, um, going back quite a while since, um, well, before he became a figure of controversy. Uh, reason being, he's a VR expert. Um, he uh, founded Oculus and he's, uh, you know, we very enthusiastically torn down every Oculus product going back since the first developer kit. So when he offered to send us his Magic Leap uh, so we could take it apart, we said yes. Oh, so it was his. Oh yeah, that, well that's that's what I, my thought was. Yeah, he probably bought a couple, one to keep in his uh, his museum of VR, which I have to imagine he has, and another one to give to you to to spill the guts of. But uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, he was our he was our our in. Uh, we have our own Magic Leap on order, but um, you know, thanks to getting a hold of of Palmer's, I think we probably got this teardown done weeks or months sooner than we would have otherwise. So, yeah, yeah. So that you, was cool. You really did. Um, anything anything special like about the lens architecture specifically like the the teardown a lot of it made sense but then once it gets to the kind of the breakdown of what's happening on a visual sense i will admit i kind of got a little lost because it really seems like it's it's doing something obviously it's doing something more than like smartphone vr where it's just literally a screen right in front of your eye and that's it it's projecting things into the light field and there's a couple of different kind of uh, planes onto which that's happening. How are they doing this? What What's going on behind the scenes? Uh, yeah, I'm with you, Jason. I have no optics training. So this was an education for me, this teardown. Um, it, it uses, uh, Magic Leap 1 uses something called waveguide displays. Um, you can think of it as, um, it's sort of like, it looks like a thin piece of glass, like a lens. Um, and uh, well, here I have... <laughs> I actually do you have, have it with you? part of the disassembled unit oh, here. So it, it basically, if I can get it up in front of the camera, it looks very much like a lens um, where the image is guided in sort of invisibly from the side. And, and I don't know if you can see on this, uh, yeah. my, my webcam, but there's a rectangular section in the middle there. That's the actual uh, display where that image is bounced into your eye. Um, so um, it's not a new technology. Waveguides have been around for a while. Um, HoloLens also uses waveguide displays. Um, but this is better. It's more sophisticated. Um, it uses actually a stack of six waveguides per eye. Um, so it's got two focus planes, and then those are each split up into three color channels. So six waveguides per eye. Uh, in that nice shot you're showing there, we've got a close-up of the waveguide, and you can see the layers all laminated together if you click that image and blow it up. Um, not fundamentally new technology, but certainly a very cool uh, implementation. Yeah. So uh, what kind of repairability score did it get? Repairability was a mixed bag. Um, you know, the speakers were great. 30 seconds to swap those out, no problem. Um, the battery was a real missed opportunity. Um, that should have been a gimme. It's, it's sort of sealed off in its own little lobe of the uh, light pack and uh, it would have been real easy to make it detachable and for some reason they didn't do that. So we scored it a three out of 10 overall on, on repairability. Um, probably not something the average person wants to crack open and try to fix themselves. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine most people probably don't want to crack open their technology because they're afraid they break it. At least I'm speaking for myself. Uh, but that's why I love watching you guys do it because you have no fear. I fix it. Uh, you guys also posted on Monday a teardown of Samsung's uh, latest Galaxy Note 9. I'm actually working on a full review. I do not expect to break my Note 9 to, to tear it open for the review. Uh, that's going to be this weekend on the screensavers. But what can you tell us about the teardown ex uh, experience, the process here? Was it much different from any of the other Galaxy phones that you've broken down? Um, you know, from the outside, it looks very similar uh, design-wise, obviously, to what's come before, the Note 8, the, the S9 Plus. It doesn't look all that different, and that's kind of borne out on the teardown as well. Um, they seem to have, Samsung seems to have settled on a design that they like, mm -hmm. and so we're seeing things like, you know, obviously new processors and upgraded cameras, but fundamentally, it's not that different from what we've seen in prior teardowns. So I had a Galaxy S3, I think, a two. It was 2014 Galaxy, whatever that was. Oh, they've come so far. <laughs> and uh, I passed it down to my daughter, and she promptly dropped it. And then I made her get a kit from you guys to replace the screen. And it wasn't that hard to replace the screen. She did it. Um, has it gotten harder since then? That was four years ago. 
Yeah, um, Samsung has been on somewhat of a downward trend repairability-wise on their phones over the years. Some of those early phones were great. You could swap out a battery you know, in 30 seconds with no tools. Um, they used to make fun of uh, Apple in some of their commercials um, because you know they would they would show photos of or videos of of Apple iPhone users that were perpetually tethered to a wall outlet because they couldn't swap out the battery. Mm. Um, I thought that was a great marketing, uh, uh, you know, stroke of genius. And and unfortunately, they backed away from that. And now they're just sealing in their batteries like everyone else. Their screens have gotten very hard to replace. Um, so it's it's been a disappointing trend for Samsung over the years. We're hoping that they will start to find a way. Now that they've kind of settled on a design that they like, maybe they'll start to find some ways to improve it repairability-wise. But they still use regular screws, unlike Apple, who uses some fancy weird <laughs> thing that you need a special tool to, to This is This is true. No security screws. So that's okay. nice. <laughs> that's good. Um, one thing that I know Samsung really kind of touted as it, it's been promoting this device is the liquid cooling system, which you can kind of see in this picture in the top device, that kind of long copper strip up there. Um, did you guys have a chance to kind of analyze that and kind of see what was what was going on there? Was there anything out of out of the ordinary there? Yeah, so uh, I have one here. Um, so this is it. This is the vaunted um, water carbon cooling system. Um, <laughs> that might be more good marketing than, yeah. than actual tech. Um, it, it seems to be a, a pretty standard uh, vapor chamber. Um, so if you're not familiar, um, you know, a normal heat sink would be just like a block of copper. Um, this is basically a hollowed out block of copper with a very small amount of fluid inside. So the processor sits at one end and the fluid gets hot, it vaporizes, it races off to the other end, it takes the heat with it. Uh, and then when that fluid condenses, uh, there's a little copper wick in here running down the center. Um, looks sort of like a soldering braid. Um, and that uh, channels the fluid back uh, to the processor to start the process over again. Um, so it's more efficient than a chunk of copper, for sure. It's it's lighter um, and it's more expensive. Um, uh, but not fundamentally different, I think, from what we found in the Note 8. <laughs> it's amazing that such a small, thin sliver of anything uh, brings so much, like, <laughs> such improvements that it's that it makes a marketing uh, campaign. Uh, and then, did you mention the repairability score on this? I know we showed it on the screen, but I can't remember if you mentioned it. Yeah, it's it's uh, coming in right at a four out of ten. That's All the right. that's the new norm for Samsung Galaxy phones in recent years. Wah wah, including the S Pen, which you also tore tore down. But I don't know why anyone's opening up their S Pen. To be honest, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what Pure, you expect to find. Purely for science, <laughs> exactly. And it's a lot of fun watching you guys do it. Yeah. So we don't have to. Uh, Jeff Suvenon from iFixit.com. Really appreciate you uh, taking time to hop on with us today. Thank you, Jeff. It was fun. Thanks, guys. Yep, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. And finally, this is hardly tech. Uh, it's definitely technic, though. Lego technic. See what I? Oh, I'm sorry. I got a. I got a face palm. <laughs> the creative team at Lego challenged themselves with building a full life size version of a Bugatti Chiron, and it only took them around one million Lego pieces to do it. They started assembly in March. Technic, if you didn't know, is a line of Lego that includes things like rods, gears, axles, motors, and kind of other more machine-like pieces that will interconnect with the traditional Lego pieces. It only took the team, and I say only uh, in jest, 13,500 hours to build this replica from scratch. And there are indeed components in there that aren't actual Lego, the steel frame, the batteries, there's two batteries in there that power it, uh, some custom 3D printed gears, and then they used actual Bugatti wheels. Uh, but most of the rest of what you see is painstakingly constructed from Lego bricks, believe it or not. When I first saw this, I was like, there's no way. And apparently it is. They even test drove the thing. It got up to a whopping 13 miles per hour. Uh, they say it can top out at 19 miles per hour. I, I have to, you know, question at what speed those bricks just start shaking apart. Uh, re but regardless, this is insane, and I love it. I don't know why you said it's not tech. I mean, it uh, it runs. It has a functional that's, speedometer. That's true. I mean, it's as tech as any automobile, I guess, is, right? And it's running, you know what? It's running on batteries, so it's as yeah. tech as a Tesla. Mm -hmm. You're right. No glue? 
It's pretty amazing. No glue in the entire car. I, <laughs> I feel like the seats would be a bit uncomfortable. Probably. Um, I don't know if this was designed for with comfort in mind, <laughs> no, necessarily. I, this, the, holding the steering wheel also looks like that. It's, look at all that. Look at it. I know. Back, uh, Isn't that insane? You can um, buy a smaller version uh, with only 3,599 parts. Um, oh, is that all? Yeah. Uh, like like really small. Like you can't. Well, it's um, I don't know how small it's. it's the size three thousand, yeah, it has got to be like I, a little like model size. Yeah, there's a there's a link in there on the on the Lego site, but um, if I, I can't actually ride inside my Lego vehicle, then I don't want to play. Uh, okay, good. Um, I'm also goes. not convinced that it's pronounced Chiron. Okay, I think it might well, be a shot shot. I don't know. Sh Who, it's Chiron. It's not shot. It's not a sh sound. I don't know. We could. Can we watch a little bit of the video? It's so good with sound. <laughs> I love. Can we oh, have that's no? see, it's 13 swift miles per hour mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. I don't think we get any sound on that. No, we don't get sound. <laughs> Me and it's, there. Oh. We decided to build a car, a true copy of a Bugatti Chiron. Chiron, and just to make you're right. Even more difficult, Chiron, by the way, in the, in the uh, news media world. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's yeah. a Chiron. <laughs> Chiron, well, it is. He says it's a Chiron, so I, I believe him. Reverb Mike thinks the title of this show should be It's a Shush. It's a, a shush sh sound. It's a shush. It's amazing. We'll think about that. Thank you, Megan, for the correction on that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, super impressive. Yes. Right? I mean, a motorized spoiler is also mm -hmm. made out of mm -hmm. Lego. I'm, I'm amazed that they could mm -hmm. do that. Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday, 2.30 p.m. Pacific, 5.30 p.m. Eastern. All you have to do is go to twit.tv slash live, and you can watch it, uh, or you can watch it in person. Because, you know, there are some people here we watching do. in person. We have a live audience today. So you can subscribe to the show or you can come into the show and see us live. Uh, you can do that. There they are. Uh, there they Woo! are. Woo! Right on. Uh, Thanks for coming in, There's some journalism students, some, some students uh, in digital media. So hopefully right we didn't uh, unlearn all, everything that they've They're been like, taught. like, I'm never doing that. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. touch that with a 10 foot pole. Uh, and if you want to tweet at me, uh, I am at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to our uh, TD today, Victor, for sweating bullets. Thanks to Colleen, Jammer B, Burke, and everybody sitting in the studio. And thanks to you for talking tech and watching Tech News Weekly. We'll see you all next week on another episode. Bye, everybody. Yay! Woo, that's